So I'm just going to get started here welcoming people. Um, if you've never used Mozilla Hubs before, there's a couple buttons on the bottom, uh, including a mute button uh, that will mute and unmute yourself. I'm going to mute everybody to begin with, and you're always welcome to unmute yourself. And I think that worked. So another button on the bottom is the React button, where we can uh, wave to each other, raise hands, and uh, do other general sort of emoji responses. Um, great, so that works too. Very cool. Uh, a third button on the bottom is share. Uh, you might have a second set of buttons that pop up if you click share. If you click avatar camera, you'll see permission maybe requested from your operating system and then maybe your camera will come on and y your face like a uh, zoom window will show up uh, on the tablet that's attached to wheels here or in the space person's helmet um, so that's just housekeeping stuff um, so if the artists and uh, hosts would like to come up to the stage we could get started stage is over here. Yeah. Awesome. Look at this. Very cool. Wow. Looks like we have at least a dozen people here already. Um, so I'd like to say hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tommy Mills. I'm the chief architect of Siberiana, together with um, fellow tech expressionism artists, uh, uh, Renata Yanishevska, Michael Pierre Price, Stephen uh, per Stephen. It's Pere. That's your last name. Pere. <coughs> Thank you. Um, over the last few months, um, we've worked together to create this space we envisioned as a playful way for presenting and sharing digital artwork. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here uh, at this time. It's exciting to share this space live. Um, I am going to be in charge of the mute button um, during the panel discussion. I will um, also keep track of people who want to uh, ask questions. If you have a comment or question, please use that react button at the bottom and use the raise hand uh, option. And I'll uh, make a list of um, people who are interested in, in asking questions of the panel. Um, so I would like to uh, thank the three artist panelists today, and I'd like to introduce their moderator, Stephen Hare. Well, uh, welcome everyone, and it's um, uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, I first uh, would now like to uh, introduce the panelists. First, we have uh, Malcolm Fernandez and um, Martin Ostachowski and Michael Pierre Price, whom I'm sure is quite familiar to all of you. Um, it's uh, interesting to be in a space like this. It's a little bit different than being on a stage and being able to orient um, so automatically to the, uh, uh, to the panel. So um, I'd like to begin actually by um, asking a question of uh, all the panelists. So the, the question is, how did your perception of your work change by putting your work into a 3D studio? You know, you might add to that, there's a connected, um, uh, might be very relevant to say, do you primarily create work for 2D or 3D? And uh, Martin, could you begin, please? Sure, thanks. Um... I think for me, I've been working with uh, 3D for about five years. Um, and I started um, 
using basically virtual reality to some sort of showcase some art. Um, so that experience felt somewhat familiar to me. Um, primarily, I, I come from a you know, traditional painting background, drifted into digital arts, and um, experienced some sort of change, right? Where I would start with physical art and then would imagine maybe like digital components or digital correspondence. And then over the years, as I progressed, it shifted towards you know, while creating having both digital and physical components in mind until I recently had the case where I started making physical pieces out of digital representations of work that I'll be creating. So it's kind of interesting, you know, as you go along this, this journey, immersing yourself with digital art, how it can change. And um, in, in this particular room, I played mostly with um, already 3D objects or 2D representations artworks, which combine 3D objects. So it felt quite natural to, to place them in a, in a VR or 3D environment. Uh huh. Yes, and um, I'll now ask the same question of um, uh, of Malcolm. Malcolm, um, how did your perception of your work change by putting your work into a three D studio? And l let us know something about your work. Do you primarily create work for two D or three uh, D spaces? Is Malcolm able to uh, produce sound? Uh. Uh, Malcolm is unmuted. But it looks like he's in the lobby now. Lobby now. Oh. <laughs> That's not in the format. Okay, well, um, uh, let's continue uh, in that case with Michael. Um, how did your perception of your work change by putting your work into a 3D studio? And um, um, so as, uh, as Martin did, uh, please say some words about um, your work. Do you primarily create work for 2D or 3D spaces? Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, I definitely am a 2D artist. Um, in a previous lifetime, I did a lot of 3D work in the game industry. So um, this sort of environment is very familiar with um, you know, my past experiences. But as a tech expressionist artist, uh, I am really interested in how perceptions of work can be changed depending on the environment or the situation in which they're presented. So for me, it's not necessarily strictly about being in a 3D environment, but it's about how the artwork can interrelate with one another. Uh, for instance, the piece that I have here that is sort of my artistic depiction of a black hole and how black holes can uh, penetrate what we consider our normal 3D reality and uh, go, be, go beyond that, if you will. Um, there, there's the idea of how this piece could relate to a related piece that might show what's at the other end of the black hole. So for me, my work is about information and about how information can be embedded in the artwork and how different pieces or different artworks in an exhibition or in a book, which is what I'm working on, can interrelate to one another. So it's going beyond just the flat piece. And 3D is sort of a metaphor for extending uh, beyond the boundaries of what we normally see as 2D artwork. 
Well, that uh, segues beautifully into uh, uh, my next question. What new interrelationships does 3D allow as a stepping stone beyond a traditional presentation? So, uh, uh, Michael, since you've already um, um, sort of opened a door into that topic, could you continue, please? Um, could, could you ask something a little, a little bit more specific, Stephen, with regards to that, so I can kind of pick it up? Um, okay. Um, let's see. So, uh, I, I think the, the background of the question is, what does this kind of, uh, virtual, uh, space expand for you about okay. the presentation of your work? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I think really, um, it's about, again, perception, and it isn't necessarily strictly about a 3D space. I mean, we're, we're used to um, navigating the internet uh, with, you know, the interface that we're normally uh, presented, which is, you know, 2D pages connecting with hyperlinks and things of that nature. And so, we're, we're very used to that. We're used to pieces of paper, we're used to books, we're used to flat presentations that simulate a 3D world. And being in a space like this now allows you to look at, well, what does that, how does that space work in presentation? And I, and I look at uh, both um, Malcolm's work, uh, which really presents um, the idea of entering a space where the space around you is really large. You feel small. And the animations that are presented with the trees and that, um, it's very, it, it really, really plays very well into the, the whole 3D space. And for me, what I'm, what I'm looking at doing, again, is I'm, I'm interested with our technology, with digital work, is now you can embed information, you can embed ideas that you could bring alive, whether it's through QR codes, whether it's using augmented reality. And those types of things can be illustrated in a 3D space that is different than in a 2D space, and, and that interests me. Uh huh. I see. All right. Um, let's see. I I see. Am I correct that uh, Malcolm has now joined the room and would like to welcome him first of all? Hello, Malcolm. Um. Am I right that Malcolm is here? might have popped in an hour. I don't see him on the list anymore. I see. <laughs> so sorry. It seems like the vulgarity is technology. Yeah, this is one of those moments when you know that you're one of the pioneers in a new technology. Those, the uh, leading edge is painful. Yes. <laughs> um, um, uh, Martin, then. Um, uh, what new relationships does 3D allow as a stepping stone uh, beyond uh, traditional presentation? You know, I think for me it was always um, about contextualizing, right? Um, in, in my room, I was, for instance, able to, to bring in two projects which are part two years, but are, are you know, from the narrative are very close connected. And it, it allows you to basically curate the experience, right? Like what elements do you want to show? Like, do you approach this um, 3D space? It's basically kind of like a canvas in itself, right? Am I showing one project? Am I showing like a, 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 a whole spectrum or range of projects? And I think that really, you know, invites you to explore it in a, in a different scale and also considering, as uh, I think Michael alluded to, you know, the, the scale, right? I think that is something which is very interesting to to explore and contextualize because 
the, the model, for instance, I have in the center of my room is something which I have you know, 3D printed in, in like very small scales, but there I went to, to create kind of like this room filling experience, um, which I don't know, you know, maybe just a little note to that. Like I work a lot with um, clouds and I work a lot with the symbolisms around it in a blockchain environment. In this particular case, using you know the cloud, it's kind of like a symbolism for a wallet where you know, people think that they have any kind of value in their wallets, so when in reality it's just like a, a mental bridge for us to comprehend that we hold digital values, but these clouds are basically, or wallets are basically empty. Um, so I think these emptiness can be expressed through scale, like tremendously better um, than it could be in a, in a physical or in a you know two D place. Yes. So, um, would you say that the the difference then between this and uh, you know an actual physical presentation in a gallery um, boils down to scale? I think I think not only scale but also to physics. You know, like I do not have to oh, no. adhere to physical laws, right? I can I can basically put impossible constructions or impossible, um, you know, things can flow. With, like I always find it fascinating how we often, when we work in three D, we revert back to traditional thinking models, right? We put walls, we put doors, we put windows, we put yeah. pedestals. Um, yet we do not have these limitations, right? And I think that is something which is which is interesting to observe that we do not necessarily use it as freely as we could. Yes, that's very interesting to observe. We're in the position then, perhaps, of uh, creating new um, sort of uh, landmarks and guideposts and things like that. Yeah, maybe we're just you know not we we we, we want to. To bridge it with with elements which are familiar, while limiting ourselves in the potential of what is possible. Yeah. yeah. So the, think, there yeah. is a value then in bridging. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think whatever you know, you, we have to make it as you have to use it as a tool, right? And and your tool could depend on the experience you want to present. Do you want to? You know, who is so, yeah. who is who is your audience? Are you looking to? you know, bridge this digital narrative to somebody who is not familiar with it, or are you playing with visual natives? Um, that might be also worth considering. I think there's no good or bad answer in that. It's really like, what are we subjective? And it's interesting to see also, you know, within the Silveriana range, a lot of different approaches, which is quite fascinating to see how people interpret that. Yes, it is. Um, yes, I agree. And that's an important point, I think, that there's uh, um, uh, we uh, can provide guideposts for the uh, the people who are new or unfamiliar to the technology. Um, uh, Michael, could you um, uh, address a question? What new experience have you had in this virtual space beyond Zoom? <laughs> um, I the I think the. Not so, not so much as a creator, but as a user of the space and, and going into the various... Uh, it's full volume. I said it's full volume. Uh, you have to go like all the way to the end of the room, the town uh, hall. They're uh, outside. Okay. We're getting... So, uh, Merganzer, 18419, who I think might be Cynthia. Sorry, I was slow on the mute. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. I'm sorry, Michael. Please continue. Okay. No, no, that's okay. Um, beyond what I talked about before, I think as as a as a um, viewer and as somebody going to the various uh, artist spaces, um, it's allowed me to see work that wouldn't have been as effective in a 2D space. Um, for instance, uh, you know, in, in Martin's space, um, it was very interesting to walk in and see some of the cloud animations, but then also 
to see the the 3D model. It, I, I don't know, Martin, what it, what you may have intended, but it almost felt like you were presenting a cloud like a skeleton. It almost reminded me of of going to the uh, Natural History Museum and seeing the old dinosaur bones and such uh, in your space. I, and, and I and I think one of the things that's interesting, and I don't think we're there now, but not knowing what sort of capabilities um, might get added over time, I don't know how robust um, the hub's space is in terms of adding more functionality. But this is one of the things I think with the purely digital environment is if we can start to allow um, more functionality in the hands of the viewers that come into a space, um, we could allow them to uh, manipulate the artwork or play around with things or add a way for them to experiment within the space itself. And then that allows artists then to create works that can interact with the community in ways that you couldn't do in a regular physical environment. Um, and I think that, that to me is a very interesting concept um, that I'd love to see uh, happen over time, which I'm, which I'm hopeful for. Stephen, I don't hear you at this point. I'm not sure if I muted you by accident. <laughs> Stephen just wrote that he can't hear anyone. Well, speaking of the interesting vagarities of technology, and Indeed. how it affects our communication. Well, I'm not sure if we lost our host here. Uh, Steven, I see you're struggling to... Well, maybe in the uh, meantime, I can just pick on, pick off uh, on, yeah. Michael's question. Is Indeed, I'm looking to create some sort of this idea of a skeleton. Um, in, in this case, the, the idea is of peeling, basically leaving it, peeling it open, like kind of like an orange peel, and, and seeing, you know, that there's basically nothing inside it. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I think I think I'm I'm totally with you. It will be interesting to explore interactivity on a digital, on a purely digital scale, right? Where we have what we are familiar with, um, you know, motion sensors or camera sensors, where it really allows a very playful approach to experiencing art and, and how we can translate that in a meaningful digital, purely digital experience will be very interesting to see um, down the road because I think the, the, the elements we've seen are, are maybe not as... Yeah, I just, yeah. Martin, I, I thought the presentation was really, really intriguing um, because mm -hmm. it, we're so used to our normal view of clouds from the earth, or even if we're in an airplane flying, is they're so amorphous. They, they change and they're fuzzy. And to see it presented in your, in your artist space was really, really, it, it was a very, it, it's a very interesting presentation. And I, and I thank you for that because it, it really, uh, you accomplished exactly what you just said there a moment ago, but in a, in, in, in a way that I hadn't seen before. And that's what I like about artists. <laughs> thank you so much. I think, I think in general, you know, when we, when we, and, and that was Stephen's question is like to see what, what is like one of the experiences you have. I think having played with, with different virtual realities and, and builders, I'm always like stunned how, you know, people which have 
the same tool set at their disposal um, creates so entirely different experiences, right? How how you can basically see a somewhat limited tool set as, as such a wide scope of, of elements and then how these outcomes are so vast and different and how everybody interprets these tools like so differently. I think that is really, for me, always like such a fascinating element of, of working with, with 3D and virtual environments, right? And this is, I think, the power of seeing these re realities or, or, or experiences next to each other where we really can then, you know, it, it contextualizes this in a different way. Yeah. Would it, would it be good to do Q and A at this point, or or does Tommy or Renata want to ask questions? <laughs> I'm happy to pop in for a second. Let me just see if I have the list of questions that Stephen was using, and we can chat for a moment while I look this up. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm here with a. It's been. I'm here with a question for Mar Martin while we're waiting. Uh, Martin, you said that you made a 3D model of the form in the center of your artist studio. Can you tell us then how it got to be looking the way it is in the studio? Um, I like, like this model itself, I created in advance, right? Like I, I it was a model I, um, I printed, I 3D printed it, and um, I, you know, as I said, it's usually with these cases, you have to do some sort of work around formats and, and um, ways to represent, but the, the way it, it looks there um, for me was to kind of experience it, I think, in, in different ways, right? That's why you see that it's represented on like two walls and in the center itself, where I think like I, I, I love this approach of um, kind of highlighting like little elements, in it, kind of like, like like thumbnails of details, and and you know exploring the form not only as a whole but just like through the details. I think is something which is for for three D models tremendously interesting um, because it it allows you to realize or capture little elements which you wouldn't be aware of it, looking at it as a whole, for instance. And I think in in my approach, you know, using fairly dark walls and then giving you the most, you know, intensive contrast with the white structure against this black contrast is 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 really play and almost dissect elements of this model and be able to to walk around it and experience it in that way. Um, the model itself is aligned basically to the sky, as are, are the models um, in, in this room. And then also looking at the animated second um, artworks, which are there, which is sort of similar somewhat, but in a different approach. The, the, the three animations, which were on the end wall underneath the sky, are basically a, a more literal approach of the visualizing a, a wallet, a traditional, you know, leather threefold wallet, but working with, with cloud textures and then trying to approach this subject a little bit different thematically. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. I think that actually um, is a good segue into the, I think what was going to be the last question that Stephen was going to ask, which is um, considering, and please excuse me if this was just asked in a less direct way, but considering your experiences within Siberiana and placing your work within this context, has that um, allowed you as an artist to think of new approaches to art making? Are you thinking of any new projects now based upon your experience setting up your work in this kind of space? I think I think it's always so stimulating looking through all the different rooms and seeing what just you know how it would what people would kind of work. You know, I I've, I've didn't necessarily see a nice 
overview of this expressionism artist other than like through feet, right? So I think that was was very, very fascinating and inspiring to see it a um, some sort of self curated, right? It's like everybody chose um, a body or range of works which they wanted to see others. Um, and also how they interpret basically now this option to, to play with room scale and, and, and you know, a 3D space. And I think there's always elements you pick up on, which you think, oh, you know, like this is like brilliant or this is something, you know, which could lead to something else. I think it's often, I don't know if, how, how you perceive it, Tommy, but like for me, um, creativity is a lot of the process for me because I try to create art every day. And as such, you know, we are like very, very responsive to little things which come back later on, right, as we are creating. And I think um, I found a lot of things which which I thought is like intriguing and, you know, worth exploring. Um, directly translated into into an idea or project maybe not but i think it's it's definitely there in the subconscious and um it it will be it will be applied when it comes to that you never know when these things bubble up out of the subconscious into other projects Absolutely. Um, michael can i direct the question to you have you felt like this experience has um brought some new ideas to your practice as an artist? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tommy. Um, it, it has, um, and I, I would say that um, since working to help curate and uh, bring this space um, you know, to the to the community of text expressionist artists, that's been an interesting process. For me personally, um, I chose the Siberiana space to sort of introduce um, some of the ideas and some of the artwork of my upcoming book that I'm working on. And and in this space, um, it's made me think a little bit more about. Um, how a book format might be able to be um, manipulated in some ways through digital technology um, that you wouldn't get to do uh, with a non-tech uh, book. And while I had planned that all along, um, working in this space, working behind the scenes to make the space happen, it's it's made me think about some of the uh, quirks and some of the strengths and weaknesses um, built in, um, and I, I think that's gonna. I think that's gonna ultimately um, alter a few of the ideas that I had. So I would say, uh, both from an end user standpoint and helping to make the space come alive, has been really instructional for me. Thank you, Michael. That I mean, it's really interesting also to think of <clears throat> um, the paradigm or the uh, of the space here being more of one of um, play. It's an environment. This three D environment is a game engine, if you will. Whereas um, you know, with Zoom, we were meeting in what's a work environment, and the paradigm is a, a different one. Uh, maybe implying different uh, uses and uh, directions that you're pushed in when, or not pushed in, but you know that are opened to you um, when using certain tools. And I feel like it's interesting to think about that because we're so familiar at this point as expressionists meeting on Zoom and having that particular um, experience, um, and and then sort of comparing and contrasting it with, with this experience. I don't know if that was a question. <laughs> no, no, I think it's, it's a good point. And I think one element, I think, is also time, right? When, when you look at these Zoom calls and sometimes artist presentation, um, it's basically the artist which defines the tag time of the artworks you see, right? And I think um, 
in, in, in this kind of context, you choose your own because there's sometimes pieces which you would wish to go back, you know, and you can through the recording. But I think as you're walking through these rooms, you, you, it's at your pace, you know, and I think that is something which I really enjoy um, because there, there's pieces which, you know, which, which capture you more than others and you want to you know, be able to go closer or zoom in closer and, and walk around it um, in a way that a Zoom call does not allow you to. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. Um, Stephen, are, are you hearing things at this point? I see you're back. Uh, yes, I am now. I awesome. Returned. Well, welcome back. Um, it seems like <laughs> whatever hiccup happened was resolved. So um, we were just, um, I, I pulled up the list of questions that um, I think you had queued up and I um, continued on. I'm not sure what of that you, you got to hear. Um, and I'm happy to turn the hosting back over to you if um, you want to pick up um, on our sort of discussion of uh, how this experience has affected our thinking as artists. Yeah, thank you, Tommy. Um, I, um, I'm uh, conscious that um, Martin has uh, a, um, uh, a timeline that he's got to uh, he'll have to leave in a few minutes. So perhaps I'll ask you, Martin, um, just uh, considering your experience in Siberiana, how do you see this influencing your future work or the presentation of your work? Maybe I'll just add one more thing, and that's, is this just another VR space uh, that will be lost in the bin of time, or is this different? Is there something, um, what's the future here? I think, I think you know, the, the, when you approach a, a project within a 3D space, it's, it, it really challenges you. It's like, what are you doing with it, right? And I think what what in this scenario more than necessarily in others for me it was like how can i draw the line between different body of works and how nicely or how easier it seems to work within a 3d space than necessarily like a blog post or you know a, a, another mean of, of of connecting artworks and i think I definitely found that I underutilize necessarily 3D spaces to some extent, you know, that I should be working more in that regard because it just allows this experience at a, at a level and, and pace, which I appreciate for myself when I, when I walk into these spaces. So I think I definitely see A, that um, it, it will definitely encourage me to do more with the idea of, of contextualizing through 3D spaces. Um, and I think I will, it encourages me definitely to continue my, my mix between the, the 2D and 3D as some sort of um, tool set to bring ideas across and communicate them because it, it already flows naturally into, into creating also experience to um, kind of look and present these works. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, you raised uh, something very interesting there. Uh, you mentioned that uh, um, you have an experience of underutilizing um, the space. What uh, would you do to um, what steps does that suggest to you? What would you do to uh, fill the gap of that uh, underutilization? I, I think in general, you know, there is, there is, I don't, I don't know how it is for you, you know, or for other artists, but, but my thinking is often we just jump from like exhibition or project to project, right? While it, it would make sense to kind of create some sort of documentation or, or contextualizing in parallel school opportunities in a 3D space where, where we do not kind of like hand pick just this individual snapshot but try to combine them in a bigger 
bigger scale and a bigger narrative. And I think underutilizing it for me means that, you know, if I create artworks with, with these different 2D, 3D elements, this doesn't it not require also a proper representation within the 3D space to experience and explore these works in a better way. And I think that was something when I when I played with my Sveberiana room, which really was fun and, and, and interesting. And I think, which makes me think that I should do that way more often because it just allows to, to make these connections in a, in a different, easier, easier, easier to grasp way maybe. That's that's the way to put it. Yes, Cer certainly. Um, we were talking about uh, expanding the scale before, uh, and you've added to uh, expand the narrative as well. Um, um, why don't I, I'll pose the same question to Michael, or the same uh, couple of questions. So, considering your experience in Siberiana, how do you see this influencing your future work? or the presentation of your work. And is this just another VR space? Oh, um, I'm not sure exactly how this might influence my future work. So that that's sort of an open-ended um, idea for me right now. Um, with regards to, is this another VR space? The simple quest or the simple answer is yes, <laughs> but <laughs> but the the big thing is the big difference is and and it's the use of the technology, and so with a community that's as creative and innovative as this international uh, community of artists um, that have come together over the last two and a half, three years. Um, this is, you know, this is sort of our first stab at it. And um, I, I think that's very telling. The, I think where the limitations can come in, and again, because I don't know, how uh, hubs might evolve over time. I just, I don't know that. To me, the promise is with the advance of more technology, especially with, with the areas of VR and AR uh, and 3D spaces, um, if, if we can put more functionality into spaces like this, then as artists, we can go beyond um, what we have just here right now, which is, which is you know, a, I think a good testament for the first iteration of what we could put together. I mean, I, I think it's really, really interesting. And, and, you know, Tommy mentioned the playfulness of this space versus the more business-like space of Zoom, that, that's not inherent in the technology. That's an, that's an expression of who we are as artists. And, and I think we have to make a distinguishment there between what the technology can do um, and how it can be pushed. And I think as artists, we're always trying to push in new directions. We're trying... We're always trying to express what hasn't been expressed before. And, and I think that's, to me, the promise of the potential for this type of technology. Um, I'm conscious of uh, it being quarter till the hour. And uh, Martin, do you have a hard stop here? Yeah, I apologize. I, my apologies. So I, I would just briefly wanted to thank you all for having me. It was really a pleasure. Um, really great to, you know, seeing so many show up on a on their saturday is it's, it's really the delight and um yeah i hope uh, to to see the the rest of the conversation down the road excellent um martin i i think i speak for a lot of people in saying uh, 
I I wish uh, you could have uh, had an opportunity to speak at a more uh, on a more extended uh, uh, basis. There was uh, I'll, I'll, you raised many intriguing points. I'll I'll try to connect that one of the Zoom calls maybe to to, to have a, a more in depth conversation down the road. Great. Thank you for so, being here. Thanks again. Thanks, have, Martin. A, have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, Michael, I'm, uh, I was uh, intrigued by, uh, let's say I was inspired, actually, by a couple of the things you were saying. Uh, would you agree that um, the space that um, um, we've created, you were talking about... Um, um, the the value coming from our sort of uh, communal effort would you say there was uh, there was a value in uh, a lot of people working uh, on their own things and the the ability to see what other people have done uh, perhaps I'm not expressing this very eloquently but uh, <laughs> would you address the uh, communal aspect of this yeah uh, I, I I mean. Just going, just visiting all of the artist spaces here, you can see um, it's not it's not uniform. I mean, we we've got, um, for instance, in Lucy Boyd Wilson's space, she she has kind of a three D sphere inside there that you can go inside and see her artwork from the inside out. And to me, that again is indicative of a wonderful use of the three D space. And I walked into Karen Lafleur's space, and she had this great animation of gears on her wall, and it's very three-dimensional looking, and it's it's a really effective space. And then Susan Detroit has her space where you can walk amongst all of her characters that are in there, um, and and I could go on and on and on about um, how each artist has created their space unique to them, what they want to share and what they want to present. And so the fact that this environment can allow for that scope of artist presentations, I think is phenomenal. And, and really, we didn't give a lot of direction to what could be done um, and I know many of the artists struggled with sort of the, the tool set to put their spaces together. And we had a number of really good uh, tutorials that, that we presented. But this is, this is my point is that if environments become more robust in what they can allow as artists and our creativity, we will naturally push the envelope to uh, expand what would be the normal fare of that kind of environment. And that to me is really inspirational, uh, just seeing what we've created here and what's you know potential for the future. Um, yes, um, well said. Let us uh, move now to, uh, with the time remaining to um, our Q and A so we have one presenter left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd be glad to field questions. There might be questions for other people too, I imagine. So I think how this works is you can, uh, Tommy, you can uh, clarify this. You can uh, use the react button at the bottom of your screen to Raise your hand. Is that how this is going to work? Exactly. Yeah. If you hit that raise hand button, which I just put up, you'll see your hand. Well, you won't actually see your hand go up. I'll see your hand go up and I'll um, let you know by saying, I see that <laughs> your hand is up. You're on the list. Um, so if you have a question, please click that raise hand button now and I'll um, make a list of uh, or a stack, if you will. Uh, maybe I'll go first while people are thinking of questions. And um, let me see if I can lower my hand. Um, my question, I, I think, 
might be a half statement as well. So I apologize in advance. One of the things that um, when Malcolm was talking about um, how it's different to observe work within this space, that there's a pacing that is now in our control as the viewer. And I find that fascinating. Um, as a photographer, and um, I, I, I often think about how long uh, I look at something or how long a viewer looks at something and who's in control of that. Um, Susan Sontag wrote um, a book called On Photography, I think in 1977, in which she uh, talks about uh, Chris Marker, who's an artist, I think in France, um, in the 60s and 70s, and his movie um, called uh, something Quatre Vents de Dromadière, uh, somebody in French, please fix that for me. Somebody speaks French, please um, correct me. But um, the, the movie is basically uh, a slideshow and him uh, presenting his work with a slight narrative, but with pacing, sequence and pacing. And Sontag points that out as the future of photography. Whereas um, in the past, the viewer has control over pacing and sequence, even in a book, which implies a sequence. You can flip pages and jump 10 by just grabbing a bunch of pages. Um, so my question, I guess, is thinking about this trajectory of control going from the viewer to the presenter in this idea of the movie, you know, going from a book to a movie where um, you sit back and you're presented to, um, are we leaning back in and becoming somehow more of a in control viewership within this space? And is that one of these differences that we're sensing? I'm not sure if that was way off in a tangent and trying to bring it back in, but um, does that make sense, Michael or, yeah, or Stephen? That, yeah, that makes total sense, Tommy. And I, I, I think that potential is here and it's in, in the, you know, thinking, thinking about again, the interface, you know, as artists, all of us have our web pages, our websites, we're on Instagram and it's very functional. It's very immediate. Uh, if we don't like something, we go to the very next thing. And that idea of pacing is really interesting to me. And, and because um, a lot of my work is both abstract and surreal because a lot of the concepts that I'm trying to present as an artist uh, are not necessarily straightforward. And so that idea of allowing people to take in and absorb and struggle with and um, try to eke out some essence of what might, might be in the work can be accomplished in the 2D work itself. But because it's digital or in this environment is digital, I can also add other elements into it that this environment can potentially deal with. And for me as an artist, that then makes engaging with my work something that then goes back into the hands of the viewer that if they so choose to use this tool or that tool or interact in this way, um, they can do that, which would not be possible in the real world without digital enhancements. And this is a natural part of this, this environment that we are partaking in. And I think for me, that's not only functional, but it can be that sense of how the digital world is unique unto itself. It's not just, it's not a replacement for the real world. Um, it's an adjunct to it. 
And yes, a 3D world sort of presents the space in the way that we normally interact with and we understand at one level. But if you think about the matrix and you think about how you know Neo learned um, that the matrix operates on the surface what looks like the real world, but underneath it, you can go beyond it. And, and that's we have that same potential here. And a lot of it is based on the functionality of the space itself. And that's where I'm hopeful that um, as technology increases, and what I've seen as a you know a game designer, what I you know what I tried to do in pushing the envelope for what users could do in that space. That I'm as an artist, that's what I'm hopeful for here as well. Very cool. Um, do we have more questions? I, I'm looking around to see if there's hands. We could. Um, Unmute if you have a question. Uh, Renata, I see your hand is up. I think you can unmute yourself. Uh, I'm not able to unmute you, actually. I just received an email from Malcolm, and he wanted me to pass on his regrets for not being able to attend and not being able to interact to Stephen, Michael, and Martin. Um, well, I think this has been uh, quite a successful experiment, and you know, if we get things worked out, we can invite him to the next panel uh, <laughs> if he's interested. Um, I think that's what he's hoping because he mentioned that awesome. as well. Awesome. Um, so this has been fun. Um, we're coming towards an hour. Uh, if there's any other questions people want on the recording, um, I'm about to um, turn off the camera uh, avatar. Um, but boy, this has been really great. Can I say thank you once again, both to Michael and Stephen, uh, the other panelists who are not here, um, everybody who came and Remain, thank you so much. Um, this has been really exciting. I think um, this could be the first of a, a series. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's interesting to see how this feels different when we have a conversation here um, as an adjunct to the real space, to the real world, as, as Michael said. I, I think that's a great um, way to think of this. Um, Stephen, can I pass the mic to you for uh, Certainly. Um, it's, um, um, I have to um, uh, say that I hope we can have uh, more events in the future like this. And perhaps, uh, you know, the first tries at things have uh, inevitable breakdowns and uh, technological uh, things. But it is gratifying to see um, us um, gathered here together and the conversations that uh, we began today um, um, were certainly stimulating. Uh, I agree. And I, I'm recording this. I'll post it to YouTube so people who missed it can see. Um, and yeah. Uh, Michael, did, did you have any closing remarks that you'd like to um, yeah, just, just a couple things. Um, it's amazing to me that, um, just a little over three years ago, uh, this, this concept of tech expressionism was introduced to me. Um, you know, I was fortunate to be one of the early folks, uh, kind of coming on board, uh, but it's really satisfying and um, I'm grateful to be part of this very vibrant community, international uh, representation, so many different viewpoints of what technology means uh, to us as artists and how we express ourselves using technology. And I feel that um, 
Tommy under your inspiration, working with Renata, working with Stephen. Uh, I've been grateful to be one of the curators to help bring this to fruition. Um, and to me, this just really represents a dynamic community that has a lot of depth and beauty to it. And I, th I think this is just really a cool, cool expression of how this community continues to grow and thrive and change and evolve. So um, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see where we, where we keep going. So thanks to everybody for participating. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And do let people know we do have doors on the second floor that can be linked to rooms that if artists want to join that haven't yet, um, both within Expressionism and people beyond. Um, Renata, did you have any last words before we um, say have a wonderful day to everybody? Yes, um, I just wanted to mention that I had some feedback about our panel being exclusively male. And we did, we, we had invited a woman artist to be part of it, but she couldn't make it. And because it's expressionism has within its manifesto a, a part where we talk about inclusivity and parity for gender and race. And I just wanted to make the point that the next panel will have some women on it. It's a yes, great reason to have, have an all-woman panel, panel yes. next time. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's plan. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm going to um, stop recording. That, that was great. Uh, you can all send your last reaction and down on the table.